Assalamu alaikum dear students. The essay that we are going to be discussing in class today uh, is written by Sir Richard Steele and uh, if you remember from what I told you when we started off uh, discussing essays in the spectator, uh, we talked about the um, historical uh, positioning of um, the, uh, the newspaper that is written under and that is published under the name of the spectator and I told you that Addison and Steele between the two of them created a character that they called Mr. Spectator and who um, is an observer on life and uh, what he's actually observing and let me remind you again that this is a male dominated society so it's a Mr. Spectator and not of course a Ms. Spectator so Mr. Spectator uh, belongs to the aristocracy and is shown as moving in the best possible circles so that whatever um, Joseph Addison and Richard Steele were writing about was actually what they themselves had observed so as such they had to place Mr. Spectator in such a way that he would move in the very same circles that Addison and Steele moved in and that is the very best of circles. So Mr. Spectator like Addison and Steele uh, was a member of the same clubs, went to the same places, also um, had uh, um, a very clear idea of uh, what the, uh, the English nation wanted and how it was being ruled. So Mr. Spectator makes observations on what is happening in society around him, the society that he is a member of. Mind you, we're not talking about middle class England, we're not talking about um, the, the working class uh, people. We're talking about those who have money and who therefore occupy a certain position in society. So let us see what Mr. Spectator sees uh, in this essay that is given number four and that was published on the 5th of March 1711. Remember the date is very important. 1711 is the year when Addison and Steele, uh, through their joint effort, started writing for the spectator. So, of course, um, Steele also, like Addison, starts off with a Latin quotation. This time it is um, from Horace and the, translated, this means a being of extraordinary and profound silence. Now, uh, this is a very important description because this describes Mr. Spectator to a T as uh, you'd, you'd say. So a being of extraordinary and profound silence. One who observes without commenting one who is a silent spectator, okay? So, uh, Mr. Steele in the form of Mr. Spectator says, an author when he first appears in the world is very apt to believe it has nothing to think of but his performances. With a good share of this vanity in my heart, I made it my business these three days to listen after my own fame. And as I have sometimes met with circumstances which did not displease me, I have been encouraged by others which gave me much mortification. So this is a kind of preamble, a kind of a, uh, a preface or an introduction to the body of the essay. Um, when we were doing different kinds of uh, essays at the beginning of uh, this module, we discussed uh, how an essay is written. And one of the things that we discussed was 
that the first paragraph is always an introduction to the topic. The first is the introduction, the last is the conclusion. In between, you have supporting paragraphs, paragraphs which give you different ideas and where those ideas are discussed in detail. So this paragraph being the opening paragraph um, has certain ideas in it and um, the stance that Mr. Spectator takes in this essay is that of an author, a writer, not Mr. Spectator, not Joseph Addison, not Richard Steele, but an author or a writer. So any writer, any author, ABC, XYZ, when he first makes an appearance in the world of readers and reading, believes that the world is only interested in his work, in what he has to say, in what he can produce. But according to Steele, this is an example of the writer's naivety. This shows that the writer is a first timer. So those of you who are just entering into the field of creative writing um, or essay writing, you need to remember that there is a first time when you start doing something, uh, when you are a novice, and uh, once you have been in the field for a long time, you know the pros and cons of everything, you know the do's and don'ts, and you conduct yourself according to the rules and regulations of that particular group of people. So when Steele talks about an author, he's talking about an author and readers. That is uh, what the author's world comprises. The author himself, his readers, um, most of whom will of course turn out to be his critics also. So what Steele is saying here is that I am one of those writers who believe that readers are concerned only with the writing and not with the writer. Yes, I know in this day and age you would not even think about it but you need to remember that this essay was written in the 18th century and the society of that time had slightly different norms and the expectations that society uh, had um, are not just of the writing but also of the writer. Now Steele uh, having just entered the world of essay writing and uh, having just started writing essays which are being published says that I too thought that readers are interested in reading and not in what the writer is like, not in trying to find out who the writer is and uh, what his lifestyle etc. is like. So these three days when the spectator um, first made its appearance, he says, I have been trying to gauge what interests the readers, what interests my readers, what interests the readers of the spectators. So he says, and um, this uh, period of observation, it's a very short period, only three days, but Mr. Spectator says, I have learned a lot. I have learned that the reading public is not just interested in the text, it is also interested in the context. And when we talk about the context, the most important thing in the context is the identity of the writer. Okay? It is incredible to think how empty 
I have in this time observed some part of the species to be what mere blanks they are when they first come abroad in the morning, how utterly they are at a stand until they are set a-going by some paragraph in a newspaper. Okay, those of you who read the newspaper first thing in the morning will be very familiar with this situation. You have to have your newspaper bright and early in the morning. Some people cannot even come awake until they get the feel of the newspaper in their hands. So when they are still slumbering, they need to be handed the newspaper so that they can open their eyes and enter the world of the living again. So according to Mr. Spectator, it's surprising that readers do not have any ideas. They don't have any thoughts in their mind until they read the newspaper. So the newspaper and therefore the essays that Addison and Steele were writing, they act as a kind of catalyst for the reader's mind. You know what a catalyst is like? You need to make something work. It will not work itself. You need to add something to provide a kind of incentive. Motivation is the word that is used very much these days, um, especially as far as students are concerned. So you as a student community will be very familiar with the word motivation, incentive, keenness. So readers of newspapers, according to Mr. Spectator, do not have any original ideas. Whatever they get, they get from their reading of newspapers. So early morning they need to have their newspaper. Such persons are very acceptable to a young author and Richard Steele considers himself one of the young authors because the young authors do not have any desire other than to mold the reader's opinions. So the ideal readership comprises of people who come with blank minds and who take in everything that the newspaper provides for them. So if I found consolation among such, I was as much disquieted by the incapacity of others. So while readers who, um, for whom these essays act as catalysts are, um, are a sign of hope for uh, the writer, at the same time, readers who come with blank minds uh, disturb the author. They disturb Mr. Spectator. The, the, I, the idea, the very thought that these readers have no idea of their own is what upsets um, Richard Steele and therefore Mr. Spectator. Um, and, and what upsets him the more um, is the kind of people who not only do not have any ideas uh, of their own, uh, but who approach the newspaper as observers, not as readers, because when you read, you take in the ideas of the writer. So, there are different categories of readers and what upsets Mr. Spectator and therefore Richard Steele is the fact that some readers take in ideas given in the newspaper or in the essay in this case, but there are others who read the newspaper not as a source of inspiration or as a kind of catalyst, but um, they approach the newspaper as observers. 
they don't put anything into the newspaper and they don't get anything out of the newspaper so there's no exchange of ideas as far as the reader and the writer are concerned the the writer has written his um, his work his essay uh, but the reader only approaches it as an observer not as an individual who is willing to imbibe different ideas and thoughts so there's so little pleasure in inquiries that so nearly concern our lives that upon the whole I resolved for the future to go on in my ordinary way and without too much fear or hope about the business of reputation to be very careful of the design of my actions but very negligent of the consequences of them so in this short period, in these three days, Steele has reached the conclusion that um, he must write what he thinks is best. And he must not concern himself with what the readers want because in the majority of cases the readers do not want anything the readers have absolutely um, no uh, issues on what they're reading they just want something to read so when you just want something to read you'll read anything you're not concerned with what you're reading whether it has anything to do with your situation with your way of life uh, or not there's absolutely no concern whatsoever with the kind of material that is being read the kind of text that is being read so mr spectator and therefore mr St uh, therefore sir richard steel says that um, i have decided not to worry about what i'm writing for the simple reason that whatever i write will be read I don't have to worry about the consequences he says I'm going to write what I think best and I'm going to communicate my ideas without any regard for whether the the readers like it or not because I have found out in this very short time that the newspaper readers will read anything that I write they're not concerned with what I'm writing about how I'm writing it they are concerned only with reading not with what they are reading but the fact that they get something to read so he says that I'm going to be a little careful but I'm not going to worry too much about the consequences because I have been reassured in these three days that the readers will read anything it is an endless and frivolous pursuit to act by any other rule than the care of satisfying our own minds in what we do so it's enough that mr spectator is describing whatever comes to his mind and he's not concerned he's not worried about what other people are thinking one would think a silent man who concerned himself with no uh, no one's breathing should be very liable to misinterpretations and yet I remember I was once taken for a Jesuit for no other reason but my profound taciturnity so now the example that he's giving um, is of himself uh, in the early essays that we discussed we pointed out the fact that Mr. Spectator is an observer and um, he is silent he doesn't participate in discussions um, he uh, doesn't want to speak he just wants to listen to see um, and to hear what is happening so he says that um, because I do not speak people think that I have taken a vow of silence now he brings in the example of the Jesuit monks and um, because uh, they have this um, this tradition of taking a vow of silence if you have heard of Trappist monks 
Trappist monks can spend their entire life not saying a single word to anyone because they have taken that vow of silence. They have sworn that they will not speak. Not that they cannot, but they will not. So because Mr. Spectator chooses not to speak, people think that he is a priest and he has taken a vow of silence. Uh, and... Uh, that is all that there is because they cannot conceive of uh, a person who is not a priest choosing not to speak which is what Mr. Spectator is in the in the initial essays um, Addison and Steele told you very clearly that Mr. Spectator is not going to speak he's going to be a silent observer he's going to be a spectator but he's going to put all his observations and his ideas down on paper in black and white so that is exactly what he is doing it is from this much misfortune that to be out of harm's way I have ever since affected crowds when you're in a crowd nobody's bothered whether you're speaking or not because there's so many people who are so keen on saying things that no one notices that you have not said anything so he says since I found out that um, people uh, think that I'm a priest and that I have taken a vow of silence I have started mixing with people in the sense that I do not go to small gatherings I try to be a part of a large gathering so that with a lot of different people speaking nobody remarks on my silence so he who comes into assemblies only to gratify his curiosity and not to make a figure enjoys the pleasure of retirement in a more exquisite degree than he possibly could in his closet so the one reason why he um, becomes a part of a crowd is because there is so much more to learn if you stay inside the house and you keep silent you will not learn anything at all but if you go out into the crowds into the busy marketplaces into as he says the assemblies you go into parliament that is when you do the maximum amount of learning because you hear things you see so many things happening when you're inside your house you only see what is happening within your house you don't see what is happening without you don't see what is happening in the outside world but when you come into a place like the parliament or you go into let's say Juma Bazaar or Sunday Bazaar or um, you visit any of the marketing um, areas you'll find out how much you learn and how fast you learn so he says to be exempt from the passions with which others are tormenting is the only pleasing solitude I can very justly say with the ancient sage and mark the spellings that Steele has used for ancient he spells ancient with a T-I, not as you and I do with a C-I-E. Okay, so the ancient sage said, I'm never less alone than when alone. Yes, you can be lonely in a crowd, but the plus point to being in a crowd is that you have so much information coming in. You learn such a lot when you are part of a big crowd, when you're part of a small community, you know each other very well and therefore you only speak on topics and areas that you are all familiar with you don't start anything new whereas in a crowd you have many different people speaking at the same time many different ideas penetrating into your mind so he says that I choose to be a part of a crowd because that is where I get most of my learning as I am insignificant to the company in public places and as it is visible I do not come thither as most do to show myself a very important point the majority of us go to a gathering to show ourselves 
not to see other people but to make a display of ourselves and mind you that's one reason why we take such a lot of trouble why we spend so much time and money on getting ready because we want to show ourselves so mr spectator says i am an insignificant person and i choose to remain that way i don't go to public gatherings to show myself i go there to see what people are doing and to preserve in my mind whatever is going on in the outside world so i gratify the vanity of all who pretend to make an appearance and often have as kind looks from well dressed gentlemen and ladies as a poet would bestow upon one of his audience now when you start to analyze this statement what mr spectator is actually trying to say is that i gratify the vanity of all those who make an appearance because i am there i am observing them therefore the vanity of other people is gratified those who dress up to be seen are rewarded because if there's nobody else i am there to see them i am there to make a written comment on their appearance on their activities so those who go to the trouble of making special preparations i gratify their vanity i observe them um i note each and every uh, movement i note each and every word sound that is uttered so i gratify the vanity of those who come into these public places to display themselves and because i am there he says i receive very kind looks and i receive a lot of smiles from people because people say at least mr spectator is there to see us if i have spent such a lot of money making these clothes and getting ready at least one person is out there who will appreciate so that's not to say that i'm calling on you students to appreciate the way i dress or the way i look but i am presenting myself as a character from mr spectator's company who has gone to the trouble of dressing up because that is what is expected of uh, them in their um, societal setup there is so many gratifications attend this public sort of obscurity that some little distaste i daily receive have lost their anguish and i did the other day without the least displeasure over here one say of me that strange fellow and another answer i have known the fellow's face for these 12 years and so must you but i believe you the first ever asked who he was so 12 years they have known each other or they have seen each other and yet they do not know who mr spectator is they are not aware of the identity of mr spectator strange idea 12 years you move in the same company you visit the same club and tea house or coffee house and you don't know the name of that person so mr spectator says this is one of the things that makes my role very rewarding because whatever uh, rudeness i encountered is dissolved when people ignore me because that's what i want i don't want acknowledgement if i'm acknowledged i'll have to speak out 
I don't want to speak. I just want to be left like a fly on the wall, firmly established there, and with its antennae trying to bring in whatever information they can from the outside world. So he says the one of the plus points of this obscurity is that people do not note you. And this other day I heard one fellow saying, you know, so and so is a strange fellow. Who is he? And his friend or the other person says, you know, we've been together 12 years and you're the first person who's asked me about the identity of this individual. 12 years is a very long time. You meet a lot of people and when you meet them again and yet again, um, you do remember names. You ask names, you're introduced formally, you strike up an acquaintanceship, maybe even a friendship. But in these 12 years, nobody has asked for the identity of Mr. Spectator. So there are, I must confess, many to whom my person is as well known as that of their nearest relations, who give themselves to no further trouble about calling me by my name or quality, but speak of me very currently by, Mr. what do you call him? So nobody calls him by his name, even those who are familiar even those with whom he has an acquaintance do not know his name. They might be able to identify him, but they will not be able to give you his name. So a totally nondescript appearance, the kind of appearance that will help him merge with the background. So Mr. What Do You Call Him is the name that he is referred to as. To make up for these trivial disadvantages, and you know, it's, it's a little uh, off-putting to be uh, addressed as Mr. What Do You Call Him. I wouldn't like that. My name is Dr. Shahina Yubati, and I don't want to be called, uh, well, well, what's your name? What's your name? Yes, you, you come here. I don't want, I, I wouldn't like that. So that's a distinct disadvantage for being um, very um, obscure in appearance or having a very nondescript appearance. That's, that's a disadvantage. But the advantage is that you can look at everyone, as he says, all nature with an unprejudiced eye. So the best thing about his position is that Mr. Spectator says, I can look at everyone without any bias, without any prejudice whatsoever. I can look at everyone, treat them all the same. So this is the greatest advantage. Remember, he's an observer, he's a spectator. So he observes and he observes everyone and gives everyone equal um, attention. He doesn't give one person a lot of attention and ignores the other. That's not like it at all. So having nothing to do with men's passions or interests, I can with greater sagacity consider their talents, manners, failings and merits. So I can observe these people, I can make judgments, I can pass judgments very objectively and without any prejudice whatsoever. That's about the best thing. It is remarkable that those who want any one sense possess the others with greater force and vivacity. So th this is something that is almost um, a law of nature. Uh, if nature takes away one sense, it gives you heightened perception in the other senses. So that um, because Mr. Spectator does not have um, the desire to speak, 
he gets all the advantages of a dumb man. That is, he hears whatever is being said around him. He doesn't participate, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't get to hear. He is not making any comments on what he sees, but that doesn't mean that he can't see. Just because he's not making a commentary does not mean that he cannot see or hear. In fact, it's an additional advantage because when people have the idea that nobody is listening to them, they will say things which they would not say ordinarily if you were going to speak up or speak out um, regarding that idea or that thought. So he says, my want of or rather resignation of speech, that is this uh, almost inability that I have fostered in my temperament and my nature gives me an additional advantage. I have a more than ordinary penetration in seeing. So I have uh, what is called sharper vision. I can see more things than an ordinary person because I am like the fly on the wall. So the fly on the wall sees everything happening within the room. There is nothing to obstruct its vision, its line of sight. So I have looked into the highest and the lowest of mankind and made shrewd guesses without being admitted to their conversation. So I have not taken part in the discussion. I have not participated on any forum at all. I have not spoken on any forum. But I have still all the information, all possible knowledge about events, about people, about places, objects, because I choose not to give voice to my opinions. So I learn a lot. I gather a lot of information. And I even find out what people are thinking. When they will not speak in the presence of other people, they will speak in my presence because they think I cannot hear. So what he is saying is, that he has an unbiased viewpoint, okay? So, he says, I see men flourishing in courts, languishing in jails, without being prejudiced from their circumstances to their favor or disadvantage, but from their inward manner of bearing their condition, often pity the prosperous and admire the unhappy. Okay, going back to the previous slide, he says, because I'm an observer, because I'm a spectator, it doesn't matter to me what people are going through. It doesn't matter to me what they're experiencing, except when I start to think about it. When I'm, when I'm an observer, when I'm a spectator, it doesn't make any difference whether a person is a king or a prisoner, the highest in the land or the lowest in the land. It doesn't make any difference to me because I'm an observer. So I'm able to comment on their situation without reference to their situation. The only time that I do feel sympathy for these people is when I start to think of how easy the life of the wealthy is and how difficult the life of the downtrodden or the unhappy people happens to be. So those who converse with the dumb know from the turn of their eyes and the changes of their countenance their sentiments of the objects before them. Um, this is again a reference to sign language. Those of you who know what sign language is will know that uh, people who do not have the power of speech communicate through signs and there is a, uh, a specially developed language in which um, different uh, actions, 
different gestures stand for different letters so you combine those letters and you form words and that's how you understand what is being said so he says that people who cannot speak they have different ways of showing through their body language what they like or what they don't I have indulged my silence to such an extravagant that the few who are intimate with me answer my smiles with concurrent sentences and argue to the very point I shaked my head at without my speaking so what he's referring to here um, is the fact that people who are used to Mr. Spectator not saying anything sometimes take advantage of his silence and say things that he doesn't like but which they want to say and the reason is they know he will not say anything they know he will not object so a rather mean thing to do but that's human nature for you so Will Honeycomb comes back to this essay if you remember he was introduced in the second essay uh, and the one that was written by Steele where he's introducing all these different characters in the club. So Will Harikum, um, the other night, he says, participated in one of the dramas that were being presented. Uh, and uh, the, the situation was such that um, Will Honeycomb had Mr. Spectator on one side of him, but the gentleman on the other side uh, was not aware of Mr. Spectator's presence because Mr. Spectator never says anything so people sort of ignore him and in time they stop seeing him there so the gentleman believed that Will was talking to himself whereas he was actually talking to Mr. Spectator and um, you know this is a situation that becomes slightly humorous when uh, an individual is there and another individual is talking to him but that individual is not perceived by anyone else and so it is thought that he is talking to himself a madman in other ways so um, he starts talking about this woman and he says that uh, this young lady uh, has a very pleasing aspect or in other words is beautiful or as you would say these days is cool um, and he says that he made uh, an answer to this statement or this question that was actually addressed to Mr. Spectator because he thought that um, Will Honeycomb was talking to him whereas he was talking to Mr. Spectator so when Mr. Spectator observed this woman um, on whom on whose appearance he's commenting um, Mr. Spectator says that this is um, what this other person remarked you know there are some people who cannot somehow accept other people looking good so this gentleman is one such kind he says I grant her dress is very becoming but perhaps the matter of choice is owing to her mother so instead of giving her the credit right away he says yes she looks very nice but I'm sure she didn't choose this dress herself what a way to compliment you know that that's that's not the way uh, that you compliment someone and then again says you know I allow a beauty to be as much to be commended for the elegance of her dress as a wit for that of his language yet if she has stolen the color of her ribbons from another or had advice about her trimmings blah 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 this is no way to pass compliments that you say yes she looks very nice but I'm sure it was not her own idea I'm sure she got the dress from somewhere else and she's borrowed the trimmings from some place other and you know yes she looks nice but she she can't take credit for it that is not the way that you compliment a person where you say that she looks nice and yet you know with a, with 
rather grudging admiration you pass comments it's it's rather mean to say that and when I threw my eyes towards the next woman and this is mr. spectator remember looking at all these beautiful young women assembled there will spoke what I looked according to his romantic imagination in the following manner and this is will honeycomb speaking behold you who dare the ch that charming version behold the beauty of her person chastised by the innocence of her thoughts chastity good nature and affability are the graces that play in her countenance she knows she's handsome but she knows she's good so this is the kind of speech that Will Honeycomb comes up with because Mr. Spectator is looking at these beautiful young women and when he looks at this one beautiful young woman Will Honeycomb sort of teases him and makes this long speech eulogizing or praising this beautiful young woman conscious beauty with adorned with conscious virtue what a spirit is there in those eyes what a bloom in that person how is the whole woman expressed in her appearance her air has the beauty of motion and her look the force of language now that is how you praise beauty not that yes she looks all right but she's borrowed the dress from her cousin and her mother-in-law gave her the um, jewelry or whatever that's not the way this is the way that beauty must be praised and mr. spectator gives a wonderful example from the speech of Will Honeycomb which is what Yes, Will Honeycomb is one of the characters given to us in the earlier essay. It was prudence to turn away my eyes from this object and therefore I turn them to the thoughtless creatures who make up the lump of that sex and move a knowing eye no more than the portraitures of insignificant people by ordinary painters which are but pictures of pictures. And here Mr. Spectator and therefore Sir Richard Steele is making um, a, a little dig at, um, at those artists who painted portraits of ladies belonging to the aristocratic class and painted them the way they wanted to not the way they were actually but magnifying certain features diminishing certain other features so that if you had a crooked nose the painter would make a very straight delicate nose so he says that such people are but pictures of pictures they don't present to you paintings of some woman but what they are giving you is a copy of a copy not something that is original thus the working of my mind is the general entertainment of my life so mr. spectator is trying to sum up whatever he has said so far and he says I never enter into the commerce of discourse with any but my particular friends so right away he's telling you that I'm not the kind of person who will discuss everything with everyone I have a very small circle of friends and it is only with these people that I discuss my thoughts my ideas they are not for the general public for the general public I write everything down but the sound of my word my ideas expressed in speech are only for a small group of people such a habit has perhaps raised in me uncommon reflections but this effect I cannot communicate but by my writing so whatever he thinks he is going to write is not going to um, deliver it in speech form 
as my pleasures are almost wholly confined to those of the sight, I take it for a peculiar happiness that I have always had an easy and familiar admittance to the fair sex. If I never praised or flattered, I never belied or contradicted them. So what he says is that um, he's not interested in gossip. He's only interested in seeing what people are doing. He's only interested in observing what is happening. He's not interested in gossip and in scandal mongering. He's only interested in watching and it is because of this that women accept him as a companion. It's when um, men start to comment on women's appearances that women dislike their presence. But if they do not make any comments, particularly negative ones, then they are not bothered. Then they will accept you. They will admit you in their inner circle. So he says that I don't praise or flatter them, but I don't pass negative comments either. So I just watch and see. I observe. I'm a spectator. I'm not a commentator. And because women compose half the world and are by the just complacence and gallantry of our nation the more powerful part of our people, I shall dedicate a considerable share of these my speculations to their service and shall lead the young through the becoming duties of virginity, marriage and widowhood. So, coming back to this slide, he says that women comprise half the population, 50 percent of the population is women. So I am going to be writing on a lot of issues that are related to women. So women compose half the world, 50 percent of the population. And what Mr. Spectator is saying is that he's going to be writing on a lot of these issues that concern women. Now that's a very um, strange idea, strange in the sense that it's a man belonging to the 18th century who is going to be writing about women's concerns. I won't say women's issues, I'll say women's concerns. And uh, if you remember the kind of society that we're talking about, the, um, the aristocratic circle, uh, most of these concerns are going to be on what is being worn, how is uh, something to be done, what does etiquette demand, and uh, how is etiquette being violated. So everything that concerns these women, he says, I'm going to be writing about. And he also says that hopefully I will be able to give them some solid uh, advice regarding their duties uh, in marriage and in widowhood and these two were rather big issues at that time. And when it is a woman's day in my works I shall endeavor at a style and air suitable to their understanding. So when it is a day that is reserved to the women um, I shall uh, make all arrangements to change the way in which I write to change the content of my essays to something that is suitable to women or that will be of interest to women. So a big concession Sir Richard Steele is making in the sense that he realized um, that his reading public comprised of women also and since there were no women writing at that time, um, Sir Richard Steele and Joseph Addison, they set out to write on uh, the concerns of women, what, what women like to read about, um, and things that women find of interest. So he says, whenever I'm doing it, I'm going to try and use language and content which will be suitable 
to the women. When I say this, I must be understood to mean that I shall not lower but exalt the subjects I treat upon. So it's not that he is going to um, denigrate the position of women, it's not that he is going to look down on women, but he is going to try to, uh, a, to elevate the status of women. Uh, now this is uh, Steele's way of answering a question before that question has been asked, of uh, providing a rebuttal to an argument that might be provided because um, he's living in uh, the 18th century and he's living at a time when uh, women had a role to play in the aristocracy but uh, many of the women were considered as being of the delicate sex, as not being able to do anything and there was a slight tendency to look down on the women because they were said to be weaker and um, more delicate than, uh, than, than the men folk. So he says, I'm not going to uh, demean my subjects, I'm going to exalt them. Discourse for their entertainment is not to be debased but refined. So a definite change in the content, theme and style but for the better, not for the worse. A man may appear learned without talking sentences as in this ordinary gesture he discovers he can dance though he does not cut capers. So now Steele is using very refined language and he says that um, you can deliver a speech and uh, convince people of your powers of persuasion without denigrating or without lowering the status of your listener. So you can talk, impress people with your powers of speech without making the other person sound small or without making the other person appear small. So he says, a man can dance, a man can talk without jumping up and down or without lowering the position of the listener. You can dance in a very dignified manner. You don't have to jump up and down and say that this is how I do the Bhangra, you can do it very nicely in a very refined manner just as you can impress people by your speech uh, without trying to make them appear small. So he says, I shall take it for the greatest glory of my work if among reasonable women this paper may furnish tea table talk. So I'm going to try my best to write on subjects that will be of importance to women. In order to it, I shall treat on matters which relate to females as they are concerned to approach or fly from the other sex or as they are tied to them by blood and I want you to pay particular attention to how uh, Addison and Steele spell certain words because um, English language being a living language has developed and is uh, continuing to develop and change and one of the things that has changed and that is changing is the way you spell certain words. So upon this occasion I think it but reasonable to declare that whatever skill I may have in speculation I shall never betray what the eyes of lovers say to each other in my presence. So he says, I'm not going to give away any secrets. I'm still a fly on the wall, I'm observing, but I shall maintain the decorum of a situation and shall not try to lower the position of anyone whom I see. And for an example, he says, that when men and women profess their love for each other in my presence, but that does not mean that I shall 
give away their secrets. I'm not going to tell anyone so-and-so is carrying on with so-and-so. That's not my purpose. My purpose is to discuss things that are of importance to women and that women would like to read about. So at the same time, I shall not think myself obliged by this promise to conceal any false protestations which I observe made by glances in public assemblies and he's still referring to men and women meeting without the consent or without the knowledge of their elders or their spouses or partners. So he says that secrets are safe with me but if I find out that anyone is not sincere in his or her feelings I am going to write about that. So it's going to be a very dangerous and tricky situation that Sir Richard Steele filed himself in because he says I'm not going to uh, lower women as subjects, I'm going to elevate them. I'm not going to reveal any gossip, I'm not going to reveal any scandal. But if I find out that something wrong is being done in my presence, then I shall call attention to it. So by this means, love during the time of my speculations shall be carried on with the same sincerity as any other affair of less consideration. As this is the greatest concern, men shall be from henceforth liable to the greatest reproach for misbehavior in it. So it's not just the women who are uh, in danger of being exposed. The men have as great a chance of being exposed as the women. Falsehood in love shall hereafter bear a blacker aspect than infidelity in friendship or villainy in business. So Steele is making categories and he says that if you deceive someone in love that is more reprehensible um, than um, infidelity in friendship or villainy in business. So it's, it's worse than cheating in business or uh, letting down a friend. For this great and good end, all breaches against that noble passion, and this noble passion, remember, is love. The cement of society shall be severely examined. So what binds society together is what is going to form the crux of his essays. Um, the, this noble passion, this noble feeling this emotion that binds men and women to each other. It is this uh, noble passion, it is this emotion, this uh, sublime feeling that is going to be examined in great detail. But this and all other matters loosely hinted at now and in my former paper shall have their proper place in my following discourses and then he gives you the list the present writing is only to admonish the world that they shall not find me an idol but a very busy spectator so uh, as Mr. Spectator Steele is going to be looking out at everyone and he's also going to be looking out for everyone he's, he's for the interests of the women as well as the men and he's going to be examining everything. So he's not an idle spectator, he's going to be a very busy spectator because he's going to be looking at everything from more than one angle. There's going to be more than one aspect of looking at things. That's all for today. Let's quickly go through some of the points that uh, Steele has uh, examined in this essay. If you remember in the very beginning he starts off by saying that um, people uh, or rather readers when they approach a text they're not just interested in what has been written but they're also interested in the writer and this is something that I have found out in the last few days. Remember it's only been three or four days since the spectator started his publication. This present essay 
uh, was published on the 5th of March 1711 and the first essay came out on the 1st of March. So um, he, he makes us realize that readers are not just interested in the text but in the context also and then he gives a further explanation of himself and he says I am a spectator and I'm going to be looking out at everything in our society with a special focus on uh, what concerns women and he says that if I'm writing on an issue that is related to women then I'm going to pay particular emphasis to uh, what is being written and how it is being presented and one of the things that concerns uh, women is marriage and he says I'm going to be uh, describing the duties of a married woman in great detail. I'll be looking at married couples and see uh, and observe how um, they conduct their lives. And I'm also going to be looking at uh, how women deal with men in different situations. And the object to do so is not to make fun of women, not to lower their uh, position as subjects but to deal with them in such a way that they, their position is elevated at the same time that they are given assistance in how to form their opinions and how to conduct their lives in a manner in which um, they as, uh, as half the population of the world live comfortable lives and live lives that can be um, held up as examples for the generations that will follow them. That's all for today. Thank you very much and Allah Hafiz until the next class.